After 1840, differences and conflicts between the North, the South, and the West became irrevocably dire. Territorial ambitions drove settlers to conquer more than one million square miles of the continent during the decade. Driven by an idealistic vision of social perfection, pioneers believed that America was destined, both by God and by history, to expand from Atlantic Ocean to Pacific Ocean. It was the same impulse that made ordinary people into social reformers. Manifest destiny was the notion that an empire of liberty, unique to the earth, could be built upon the American continent. The movement inspired generations of idealists to brave the peripheries of the American frontier. Hundreds of thousands of white and black Americans traveled to the far western regions of the continent between 1840 and 1860. Most were from the old northwest, they were young, and they traveled in family groups. Many were relatively prosperous, but poor people made the trip as laborers, servants, teachers, farmhands, and prostitutes. Groups heading for areas where mining or lumbering was the principal economic activity consisted mostly of men. Westward migrants uh, generally gathered at one of a handful of uh, major depots in either Iowa or Missouri, joined a wagon train led by hired guides, and set off with their belongings piled into covered wagons, their livestock trailing behind. The major route west was the 2,000-mile Oregon Trail, which stretched from Independence, Missouri, across the Great Plains, over the Rocky Mountains, and through to California or Oregon. Other migrations moved along the Santa Fe Trail, southwest from Missouri and into New Mexico. Westward migration was arduous, and it lasted nearly a, a half a year, typically made in November when the weather was most suitable. The risk of snow on the Rockies haunted the migrants. Everyone, everyone walked to lighten the load for their horses, and cholera decimated many groups. Despite its hardships, many travelers found the journey a communal experience. They tended to move west with their neighbors and friends, and the values of cooperation on the trail was important for survival. Only a handful of settlers actually experienced Indian attacks. One-tenth of one percent of settlers died from conflict with the tribes, while a much larger number of migrants benefited from Indian guides, horse traders, and fresh food couriers. Texas exemplifies the conflict of interests initiated by American territorial expansion. White settlers who had legally secured the Mexican region claimed Texas as an independent republic in 1836, under increased pressure from Mexico's dictator, General Santa Ana. At the Battle of San Jacinto, General Sam Houston and his band of American settlers, Tejanos uh, and Tejanos, defeated the Mexican army and took Santa Ana prisoner. Their independence secured, President Sam Houston sent delegates to Washington to apply for statehood. Andrew Jackson, fearing that adding a large slave state to the Union would only increase sectional tensions, blocked annexation, and even delayed recognizing the independent nation of Texas. Texas attracted the attention of England and France, who saw an opportunity to keep the upstart nation in check by aligning themselves with the nation of Texas. In 1844, another effort to secure statehood was denied, this time by northern senators opposed to yet another cotton-growing slave state in the Union. Out in the Pacific Northwest, both Great Britain and the United States claimed sovereignty, but by the 1840s, Americans dwarfed the British settlers out uh, in the Northwest, especially up and down the Pacific coast. Americans had also devastated much of the Indian population through the accidental transmission of measles, leaving the territory largely open to full American ownership. In the presidential election of 1844, James K. Polk, a Democrat, ran on the platform that the reoccupation of Oregon and the reannexation uh, re of Texas at the earliest practicable period are the great American measures. By combining the Oregon and Texas questions, the Democrats appealed to both northern and southern expansionists, and he won the election handily. Polk secured congressional assent to annex Texas in 1845, and despite more English saber-rattling, he talked the British into drawing a line on the 49th parallel in 1846, the line we understand today, as the northern boundary of the United States between the United States and Canada. The annexation of Texas prompted a break in diplomatic relations between Mexico and Washington. Further disputes over the boundary between the two only inflamed tensions. Uh, General Zachary Taylor and his army were sent to Texas to protect the new state against a possible Mexican invasion. Mexico was worried about its claim on New Mexico, whose flourishing multiracial society had become more and more American after an attempt, uh, an important trade relationship developed between Santa Fe in Independence, Missouri. So we're seeing New Mexico become a lot more American than Mexican. California, too, was becoming increasingly, incre increasingly American, even though at this point it's still Mexican territory. First it was the crews of whaling ships stopping in California for provisions. Then it was the white merchants who opened stores to sell goods to the Mexicans and Indians who lived there. Then pioneering families who entered California from the east and settled near Sacramento. These families dreamed of bringing California under the jurisdiction of the United States 
and President James Polk had the same aspirations. After he sent General uh, Zachary Taylor to Texas, he secretly ordered the commander of the Pacific Naval Squadron to seize California ports if Mexico declared war on the United States in Texas. Word was quietly sent to American settlers there, then an uprising against the Mexican army would be supported by American troops. Having prepared for war, Polk prodded the Mexicans in conflict by sending troops across the border to the edge of the Rio Grande. After months of inactivity, Americans accused Mexican troops of crossing their side of the river, and war was declared by the uh, United States Congress, with only a handful of congressmen voting against the war. Critics charged Polk with deliberately inciting the conflict, and the number of opponents grew as the casualties, expense, and length of the war increased. Once war had been declared, Americans moved quickly to seize California, New Mexico, Texas, and even Mexico itself. The details of the war are not as important as the outcomes. The city of Santa Fe was seized without opposition. The American Navy helped, uh, uh, helped settlers take California in the Bear Flag Revolt. And General Winfield Scott advanced 260 miles along the Mexican National Highway, finally seizing Mexico City. Under pressure to annex much of Mexico itself, Polk sent a special envoy to Mexico to sign a peace treaty. Under that Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, Mexico agreed to cede California and New Mexico to the United States and to forever recognize Texas all the way uh, to the Rio Grande. Polk tried to be a president whose policies transcended sectional divisions, but by repeatedly uh, placating the sections of, of the country, he gradually earned the mistrust of Northerners and Westerners. Polk supported a proposal to extend the Missouri Compromise Line through the new territories all the way to the Pacific Ocean, banning slavery north of the line and permitting it southward, so-called Mason-Dixon Line. Others supported a plan of popular sovereignty, which would allow the people of each territory to decide the status of slavery in their own state. Both Democrats and Whigs tried to avoid the issue of slavery in 1848, uh, the election there, which pitted Polk's successor against General Zachary Taylor, the man who had led the army in Mexico. Opponents of slavery turned to the Free Soil Party, and nominated former President Martin Van Buren. But Taylor won the election of Free Soilers and earned 10% of the vote and picked up 10 congressional seats. Let me say that again. Though Taylor won the election, comma, the Free Soilers earned 10% of the vote and picked up 10 congressional seats, highlighting, highlighting the inability of existing political parties to contain the political passion slavery was creating and foreshadowing the collapse of the second party system in the 1850s. Much different from the typical westward migratory experience, the California gold rush, set off by the discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill in 1849, attracted tens of thousands of 49ers who were ill-prepared white men from all across the country who flooded the California countryside en masse. While few struck it rich, many stayed in California and swelled the urban populations of the territory. Chinese, Europeans, South Americans, Mexicans, Indians, and free blacks were also drawn to the territory to wash the laundry, cook the food, and fill the vacuum typically filled by women, making the territory an unusually turbulent and raucous American outpost. An 1849 effort by Taylor, uh, President Taylor, to admit California as a free state drew the ire of southern slave states, who understood the free slave balance stood even at 15 apiece. If California became a free state, the emerging territories of Utah, New Mexico, and Oregon seemed likely to follow suit. But many otherwise moderate southern leaders now began to talk about secession from the Union. In the North, every state legislature but one adopted a resolution demanding the prohibition of slavery out in these western new territories. As the threat of Southern secession loomed, an effort at a grand compromise to the slavery issue, crafted by the aging Henry Clay, was brought before Congress in 1850. Stephen A. Douglas, a senator from Illinois, succeeded in breaking up Clay's compromise into a series of bills that could be voted on separately. As such, the Compromise of 1850 was a victory of self-interest as different factions got bits of what they wanted, a free California for abolitionists, stricter fugitive slave laws for Southerners, etc. Still, Congress enacted all the components of Clay's compromise in short order, and the effort was hailed as, as a triumph of statesmanship that would settle the sectional problem of the United States once and for all. An uneasy truce held for two years when abolitionists began to break away from the Whig Party to the Free Soil Party over the enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Act. Mobs formed in some northern cities to prevent the enforcement of the law, and some states passed their own laws barring the deportation of fugitive slaves. These are slaves who'd run away. White Southerners watched with growing alarm as the element, as the element of the Compromise of 1850 that they considered a serious victory was made moot by northern defiance. President Franklin Pierce, who succeeded Taylor after stomach illness had killed him, hoped to dampen sectional controversy by supporting a movement in the Democratic Party known as Young America. Its adherents saw the expansion of American democracy throughout the world 
as a way to, di uh, to divert attention from the controversies over slavery. They dreamed of acquiring new territories in the Western Hemisphere and extending the American Empire in all directions. Every effort to secure new territory in places like Cuba, Hawaii, and Canada inflamed tensions from one side of the slavery question or another, and the movement failed to gain traction in Congress. As settlers moved into the Great Plains, the question of what route a transcontinental railroad also stoked the slavery debate. Northerners favored an eastern terminus in Chicago, while southerners favored St. Louis, Memphis, or New Orleans. Uh, both sides scrambled to make a more favorable case. For southerners, that meant buying a strip of Mexican land that threatened to complicate the route. And for northerners, it meant legally uh, annexing Indian lands that blocked their progress. Stephen A. Douglas, in an effort to secure a northern rail route, uh, drafted a bill called the Kansas-Nebraska Act that catered to southern interests. This bill repealed the Missouri Compromise while opening up the territories of Kansas and Nebraska to white expansion and thus a northern rail route. The bill also allowed these new territories to decide their own slave or free state. After fierce debate, Pierce signed the bill into law in 1854 with the unanimous, unanimous support of Southerners and tepid support of Northern Democrats. No piece of legislation in American history produced so many immediate, sweeping, and ominous political consequences. It destroyed the Whig Party, divided Northern Democrats, and spurred the creation of a new political party that was sectional in its composition and creed. Those opposed to Douglas's bill began to call themselves the Republicans in 1854, and they quickly took power in the House of Representatives. After the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, white settlers poured into the two new territories. Thousands of Missourians, some traveling in armed groups, swelled the ranks of Kansas just before elections were held for the territorial legislature, swinging the status of the, of the state towards slavery. Outraged free staters wrote a separate constitution and petitioned Congress for statehood. President Pierce denounced the free staters as traitors and threw his support behind the pro-slavery legislature. Efforts to intimidate the free staters was met with violent retribution. John Brown, an abolitionist zealot who had moved to Kansas to see it become a free state, began to murder slave state settlers. Bouts of guerrilla warfare broke out among the factions, and bleeding Kansas became a powerful symbol of the sectional controversy in American politics. In the United States Congress, a war of words over slavery led Preston Brooks, a South Carolina member of the House, to nearly beat Charles Sumner, a Massachusetts member of the Senate, to death on the floor of the Senate. While Sumner became a martyr to the barbarism of the South among Northerners, Brooks became a hero to Southerners and easily won re-election after being censured by his colleagues. These tensions were a reflection of the hardening of ideas on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line. In the North, assumptions about the proper structure of society came to center on the belief in free labor. Most white Northerners came to believe that slavery was dangerous, not because of what it did to blacks, uh, but what it did to the whites. At the heart of American democracy, they argued, was the right to own property, to control their own labor, and to pursue opportunities for betterment. The South, then, was the antithesis of democracy, the opposite. It was a closed, static, or unchanging society in which slavery preserved an entrenched aristocracy, or wealthy elite. The South was a stagnant place, and their aristocracy threatened the free enterprise and prosperity of the northern states. The only solution to the slave power conspiracy was to fight the spread of slavery and extend the nation's free labor ideals to all sections of the country. This ideology lay at the heart of the new Republican Party. In the South, a different ideology was emerging. Spurred by the murderous Nat Turner uprising in 1831, the explosion of the cotton economy, and the growth of the radical abolitionist movement in the North, a new intellectual defense of slavery took shape. The pro-slavery argument said that slavery was a positive good, good for slaves who enjoyed better conditions than many northern workers, good for southern society because it ensured peace between blacks and whites, and good for the country because the southern economy was essential to the success of the nation. Above all, southern apologists argued that slavery was good because it formed the foundation for the southern way of life. White southerners saw a spirit of greed, debauchery, and destructiveness in the factories, the immigrant, immigrant ghettos, and the impersonal cities of the north. Southerners believed that they had created a stable, orderly society, free from the feuds between capital and labor plaguing the free states. Their trump card was, was the so-called biological inferiority of, African, of the African-American slave, who southerners have claimed was unfit to take care of himself, let alone exercise the rights of American citizenship. The election of 1856 pitted candidates with short political resumes against one, one another. The Democrat James Buchanan, a meek and indecisive former minister, was narrowly elected, but quickly shrank in the face of an economic depression and a strengthening Republican Party. The Supreme Court's Dred Scott decision brought the High Court, the, the Supreme Court, into the slavery debate finally. 
In their various rulings on the 1857 case, the majority argue that Dred Scott, a former slave who had lived in free states and had been found free by lower courts after his master's death, could not bring a case to the court because blacks had no claim to citizenship. Slaves were property and Congress possessed no authority to pass a law depriving persons of their slave property. The Missouri Compromise, therefore, had always been unconstitutional, according to the court. While an individual state was still free to prohibit slavery within its borders, the federal government was suddenly powerless to regulate slave laws in the United States. This happens immediately after the decision and invalidates all these old laws. Southerners were elated, and Republicans threatened to stack the Supreme Court to reverse the decision. Buchanan timidly endorsed the decision and shifted his focus to Kansas, which after much politicking was able to enter the Union as a free state. Given the gravity of the sectional crisis, the congressional elections of 1858 took on special significance. Of particular note was the United States Senate, which pitted Stephen Douglas, the most prominent Northern Democrat, against Abraham Lincoln, who was largely un unknown outside of Illinois. Lincoln was a successful lawyer who had long been involved in state politics. He tried to raise his profile by challenging Douglas to a series of debates which attracted enormous crowds and media attention. At the heart of the debates was the basic difference on the matter of slavery. While Douglas admitted no moral position on the issue, Lincoln extended the argument and suggested that if blacks were not entitled to basic human rights, poor white laborers might soon join the ranks. While Lincoln believed that slavery was wrong, he was not an abolitionist. He could not yet envision an easy alternative to slavery in areas where it had already existed. And he shared the prevailing Yankee view that slaves were not prepared to live side by side with whites. He and his party would arrest the further spread of slavery and would trust that the institution would gradually die out where it currently existed. Lincoln lost his bid for the Senate, but Republicans did well nationally, and Lincoln's views on the subject began to gather a national following. Before the great emancipator took his turn on the stage, though, it was the abolitionist John Brown who nearly instigated war with the slave states. After his success in Kansas, John Brown tried to organize a slave insurrection in the South with the financial aid of prominent Northern abolitionists. He and 18 followers seized control of Harper's Ferry, Virginia, he was eventually besieged by United States troops under the command of uh, General Robert E. Lee. Though Brown and six followers were hanged, no single event did more to convince white Southerners that they could not live safely within the confines of the Union. Many Southerners believed, incorrectly, that John Brown's raid had, been the, uh, had the official support of the Republican Party and feared the North was firmly committed to producing a full-scale slave insurrection. After the election of 1860, or excuse me, as the election of 1860 approached, the Democratic Party was divided between Southerners, who demanded a pro-slavery candidate, and Westerners, who supported the idea of popular sovereignty or the policy of allowing states to choose their own uh, free or slave state status. Their presidential convention fell apart, and two candidates were nominated to represent the party on the national ballot. Republicans, meanwhile, worked hard to broaden their appeal. They supported popular sovereignty, uh, funded domestic improvements, supported old, uh, older uh, Whig party policies, but also argued that neither Congress nor territorial legislatures could legalize slavery in the territories. They chose Abraham Lincoln, a Republican with no political baggage, as their candidate. With a divided uh, candidate field, Lincoln won the Electoral College majority, but secured only about 40% of the popular vote. Though Republicans failed to win control of Congress, the election of Lincoln became the final signal to many white Southerners that their position in the Union was hopeless. Within a few weeks of Lincoln's victory, the process of disunion began.